Good morning again. Welcome back. Uh, our next talk is by Casey West, uh, working at, in internet infrastructure, web app security, and design, taught Casey to be paranoid, UX-oriented, problem-solving internet plumber. His earliest contributions to Perl live to this day on your Mac. Uh, this morning, he will be talking about the 12-factor container. Please make him welcome. It, it doesn't have to be a Mac, uh, but it could be. Hi. Um, so yeah, the 12-factor container. Uh, I'm Casey West. Um, just to, uh, to give you some opportunities to connect with me if you, if you want to, I want to make sure to get it out of the way because it turns out uh, that might be hard to read down there. That's my Twitter handle. Um, so who, who here is on Twitter? Heard of Twitter? 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 Some? OK, good. Uh, you can reach out to me um, during the talk if you really want to, but uh, after the talk will probably work better. Uh, email. Who's heard of e mail? <laughs> mail with an e. Okay, good. Uh, I, d I do have a website where I sometimes uh, rant and write about things. If you want to take a look at that. Uh, and the the days since I last used that email joke are now zero. I really like it. Um, so I work for Pivotal. Uh, we are a, a company that uh, we like to say we transform the way the world builds software. Um, what, they, what they let me do is uh, just travel the world and, and share good ideas. Uh, I don't have to sell anything. I really like that about our company. And we make an incredible amount of open source software. Um, so that makes me happy, too. I'm not going to talk about any of it uh, today. <laughs> um, so this talk really isn't uh, strictly about containers. Uh, don't tell the organizers. I don't want them to find out. Um, this talk is more about operational maturity. So I'd like to up-level the conversation a little bit uh, from you know, containers as a low-level Linux kernel feature with some file system options uh, to you know, how the heck we use these things to do something meaningful. Um, so I'm going to say that you, know, you must be this tall to ride this ride. And I'm not a very tall person, but uh, uh, you know, not, not actually physically. <laughs> um, Let's ask a couple of questions, though. Uh, I like hand-based participation, as you might have seen. So can you read that? Um, how many people here have, have heard of containers before coming to this talk? Well, that's fortunate. OK. And, uh, and you use them, uh, let's say, in, in a development situation playing around. OK, keep your hand up for that. Um, in production right now? OK, I, I've done it. We can drink a beer and talk about that later. <laughs> Um, no, they're good. They're good. Uh, how about uh, schedulers? So uh, schedulers right now are very popular for distributing workloads on a, on a distributed set of computing resources. Uh, often those are in containers. So how many people have used those in production, we'll say? Um, like Amazon uh, uh, Elastic Container stuff or Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, Diaz, Mesos with Marathon. Yeah, OK. Cool. Great. A few people. How about the cloud? Otherwise known as other people's computers. Who's used other people's computers? Yeah, OK, good, good. All right, so that gives me an idea of, of, of where we're all at. That's good. I'll just get this out of the way. I want, I want to make sure that you get your quota. So Docker, 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 Docker. OK, now we've discussed Docker. Great. So <laughs> let's go ahead and talk about uh, the factors. So who's heard of the, this 12-factor concept for application development? Right, so this came out of Heroku. It was a fantastic idea. They wrote up a really beautiful uh, website, 12factor.net, the, the number 12. And, uh, and they have some fantastic essays there. And they're really about uh, software design principles that you can apply to your applications, uh, to your architecture, in order to get um, some rep repeatability, some resilience, uh, some reliability out of your applications when you're running them on the cloud. And, Running things in, uh, in a distributed way is a little bit different. Uh, running them on, uh, on the cloud where everything is network attached uh, is a little bit different than a traditional model where you threw a bunch of things in a server in the closet and you called it production, which is where I come from. Um, but now we got to do things a little differently. So first factor, one code base, tracked in revision control, uh, with many deploys. Okay, so the, the, the way we're going to talk about these things is we're going to do anti-patterns and best practices. Uh, 
And what's going to be fun is uh, I'm not sure which ones come in which order, so we'll find out whether we rant first or we, we talk about good things first, uh, but it's going to be a good time. So, so an anti-pattern is building separate images for staging and production. Uh, so if you've used Docker, for example, you know that you can tag releases and you can incrementally release. Um, one of the things that we used to do uh, that we can't do anymore in order to have uh, one code base with many deploys is you can't build a developer or a staging image, a golden image, whether it's a virtual machine or a container or what have you. You need to build one container. And that container is immutable. It's a point in time. Uh, and actually, as an aside, let's talk about immutable in infrastructure and immutability. How many people have heard this concept of immutability, right? And then, at the same time, we talk about changing things all the time really fast. So what does that mean? Uh, the idea is that you have a snapshot, a point in time that you can always go back to uh, that's consistent and reliable. It has provenance, which is a word that the auditors of the world like to use. Um, it has provenance. You know where it came from. You know how it got built. You know what it is. You know really what's in there. And it doesn't change. Um, immutable infrastructure is not the same as not changing your infrastructure. So let's remember that the idea here is to have something that you can go back to with some measure of, of reliability. Uh, but you can also move forward by changing, uh, changing things uh, frequently. So in this new world, you build one image and you run it everywhere. And the way, if you want to have some toggles or some, uh, some control over operational characteristics in development, staging, or production, if you want it to behave a little differently, maybe provide some additional logging uh, in staging, for example, um, tracing, whatever, uh, you, you, you manage that by uh, toggling the, the way the software works, but not by, by fundamentally changing what you're deploying. And we'll, we'll talk about some ways to do that in a second. Uh, right, so here's another anti-pattern. Uh, in, again, in Docker, when you, when you build images and you, and you push them, uh, you can tag them. You can give them any label tag you want. Typically, we're using uh, um, semantic versioning. Um, but do not build specific dev and prod images using, using those tags. And this, is, this goes back to uh, the same thing that we just described. You can't you can't deploy different things to different environments. They have to remain as consistent as possible, OK? Uh, uh, best practice, right. So you can use the environment or uh, feature flags in your application to control uh, the operational characteristics of an app whenever you're deploying it so that you can toggle things on and off. You can change behaviors uh, of, of a running application, but you do it uh, in a much more controlled way and in a way that still allows you to maintain the concept of one code base many deploys. Um, if, oh, I forgot to ask a really important question. Uh, how many folks would self-describe as operators in here? You, you, know, you, you run the stuff, right? You keep it alive. You take the paging calls at 3 AM. And then, and then how many people would self-describe as developers? You make the stuff that keeps the operators up at 3 AM, <laughs> right? OK, so we've got a good mix here, and that's fantastic. And then how many people would say, you know, you're DevOps, you, you have to do everything? <laughs> yeah, OK, so, so a bunch of folks, that's good. Uh, I, I bring that up because uh, feature flags are a big source of contention between uh, developers and operators a lot of the time. And that's because developers are really bad at writing software that takes advantage of feature flags effectively. And, and I should say, I am a developer. So I, I, I am more on the side of I build the stuff that breaks than I try to keep it running desperately. But uh, uh, feature flags are a good idea, but they are very challenging. You have to have a certain amount of rigor in your development process in order to use them effectively, maintain them, make sure you don't have dead code just lingering in your, in your code base for, for years. Uh, but they're still a good idea. And one very lightweight way you can do that is with environment variables, which is also, uh, incidentally, a key to building solid containers that you can, that you can run on the cloud. Um, so here's another factor. Uh, explicitly declare and isolate your dependencies. A lot of folks tend to focus on explicitly declaring those dependencies. And I think that's important. Um, but I think uh, explicitly isolating your dependencies is also really important, uh, especially uh, whenever you're trying to build containers. And, uh, and if you're attempting to uh, venture out into this brave new world of microservices, which is a great way uh, 
of saying, now, now I, instead of having one deployment that breaks every month, I have 100 deployments that break every month. Um, if you're tr venturing out into that world, you're going to have to build your containers in a much more structured fashion. Uh, so here's one anti-pattern, latest. So what version of Ruby are you running right now? What version of that Ruby library are you running right now? And if you don't know the answer to that, you're done. <laughs> you're screwed. Um, so latest is one of the worst things. It's, it's also bad whenever you do a Docker pull with the tag latest. Do not. Do not do that. Uh, you need to know the version number of the things you're running. It's critically important. Uh, declaring version numbers of upstream dependencies is a best practice. So that's that corollary there. Um, so here's a best practice that, that I've, I've done uh, that I think works out very well, which is to depend on base images for default file systems and run times. So when you're building a Docker image, it can be very, uh, and I'm, I'm using Docker a lot because it's the interface people most know about containers. Um, when you're building that container, it can be very alluring to start off by just cramming a bunch of essentially janky bash into your Docker file and saying that I have operationally mature build pipelines now, right? Um, the problem is whenever you're, you're doing 100 different services and they all depend on a base Linux file system or they're all written in Java or they're all written in Ruby and you have a, a, a runtime that you're also building and then you have 100 Docker files, how do you keep all this stuff in sync? So the model that I've used that I've found very effective is to build a base a base operating system image, and then depend on that image to build specific runtime images for static sites or Ruby sites or Java sites. And these things exist out in the public now. Um, if you run them without inspecting how they get built and ensuring that they are secure and they are going to RMRF your, your like distributed system, then good luck to you. Um, but you do you do want to you do want to then build your runtimes on top of that, and then it becomes very simple for you to simply put your app or your binary into the container on top of those base images, and your Docker files become much more manageable, and your build pipelines become much more manageable. A very tangible reason to do this is what happens when shell shock hits. All right? How do you update 100 Docker containers and make sure that they're all sorted out, and then distribute them out into your into your cluster? Uh, if you're building on base images, you can, you can rebuild the base operating system, for, for instance, to fix that CVE. Then you can rebuild the runtime images that depend on it. And then you can build all, rebuild all of your applications, and you can do a rolling deploy. And you're out the door. And you know that every new update that you do to those applications is going to have that CVE fix, because it's right down at the bottom. It's more maintainable that way. So storing configuration in the environment. We talked about this a little bit. This is um, one of those special sauce things that kind of cures a lot of ails. Uh, I'll just get right to um, an anti-pattern, config.yaml in your source code. Or config.yaml built by a build pipeline that you deploy to each server that you're running. Don't do that anymore. A config.yaml, uh, first of all, will end up existing on your file system. It gets read into memory and probably turned into a data structure in your application anyway. And at that point, you have environment variables. So just use environment variables. Um, I throw in properties.xml because I don't like Java very much. And uh, I work with some people who are some of the best Spring developers in the world. They make the Spring framework. We, we incubate that project at, at Pivotal and make it available to the world. And, and that doesn't mean I have to like it. Um, but properties.xml is another example of an anti-pattern. Or pom.xml if you really hate yourself. I know the Java developer is going like, to come at me later. Anyway, uh, hard-coded feature flags are also an anti-pattern. When you have you know, a Boolean in your code base that says, does, do our, does our application work like this or like that? Maybe for A-B testing maybe for an experimental feature. Um, really just put those in environment variables. So the best practice is that this one is literally about environment variables. And I, I wanted to mic drop, but now I've just got water and it'll make a mess. And the mic is attached to my head, which would hurt. All right, treating backing services as attached resources. <sighs> so the anti-pattern. <laughs> 
there's, there's no local disk. This one is incredibly important. When you're porting an application to try and make it run on the cloud or to run in a container, and it relies on the local disk for session storage or that infamous and hated properties.xml, um, this is usually one of the first lines of code that you're going to have to refactor and change. You're going to have to bring that information in from somewhere else. It's going to be network attached. It's going to be on the network somewhere. Where? As, an, as a developer, you don't know. And you shouldn't have to know. This one is so important that I, I wanted to make sure that you understood it. So what I did was I made it bigger. And then I made it bigger again. You don't have local disk. And if we want to talk over a pint or a five about uh, volume storage attachments in, in Docker and how that breaks distributed systems, I would love to do that. Not, not right now, but in well, about 30 minutes, we could do that. Um, you don't have local disk. So this is one of, the, one of the first things you have to tackle as an application team whenever you want to write something that's 12 factor in the first place. Um, and my strong recommendation for you, in order to have something that would be portable, in order to build an image or build a container, build an artifact that you can run on the cloud uh, and you can deploy it where it's actually portable, uh, at least right now in the state of the world when it comes to container technology, don't rely on local disks, don't rely on volume mounts. Yeah, oh, I don't think I added that in. Don't, just don't re-implement NFS, that's all I ask. So best practice, connect the network attached services using connection information from the environment. That last bit, connection information from the environment, is important because that's the basis, the fundamental basis for uh, service discovery. So just as it's bad to store session information or, or data on a local file system when you're trying to run in a distributed system, it's also bad to hard code the connection information for the host, port, IP address, and password, and you know, SSL certs for connecting to your backing services. You need to get that from yet another service. If it sounds complicated, it is. Um, you can use something like Eureka, for example, to, uh, to manage that. Uh, you can use DNS creatively, although I don't think that really helps with uh, credentials. If you want to have auto-generated authentication credential information, a, serv a proper service discovery agent is really going to work best for you that way. Um, but, uh, but, it, but it would be a start. So you could use DNS that you can quickly update. Sky DNS is a, is a great tool for something like that. Eureka is great for service discovery. Just make sure you're not hard coding connection details into your applications. OK, strictly separate build and run stages. So the anti-pattern is install on deploy. Uh, in my intro, it was mentioned that you know, my contributions to Perl live on, on your computer. Um, it's, it's a fun parlor trick to walk into an Apple store and be able to pull my name up on any Mac. Um, so I, 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 write, I write Perl, or I wrote Perl uh, for a long time. I put about 100 CPAN modules on the internet. They all sucked, let's be honest. But the, in the Perl ecosystem, as an example, I'm picking on my own, on, on my own here, uh, which I hope is OK. And the Perl ecosystem. Uh, you install CPAN libraries when you want to install your application or upgrade it. Uh, you run all the tests when you do that install, and that's all part of the deployment process, typically. Um, if you're building golden images or AMIs, or you're using maybe Packer, who's heard of Packer from HashiCorp, if you're using Packer to build images in an automated fashion, which, which is cool, um, then, you're, then you're separating that process of installation from the deployment, right? And it's important to do that. So containers have a life cycle. Come on, there we go. So you build immutal, immutable images, and then you run those images. That's it. So this is painfully obvious to me especially if you're in a containerized world. You don't really have an example. So here are some other obvious things that are just as painfully obvious. You know, you eat when you're hungry, and you, and you sleep when you're tired, and you, know, you book me to, to speak at your events. That's just painfully obvious. Basically, just respect the life cycle. So Docker containers have a life cycle. You build, you run, 
you destroy. Uh, who's heard of, uh, of treating your infrastructure as uh, cattle and not pets? Yeah, so I don't know why we're so callous about cattle, but you know, apparently we can just kill them all the time and we don't feel so bad about it. Um, you should feel the same way about your application instances. They shouldn't be that, that special, right? So execute the app as one or more uh, stateless processes. We've already talked about where you store things and how you get configuration information. So we're already well on our way to building what would, we would call a stateless application. Now, I, I think that this can be challenging because in the old world, we used to think of our application as, a, as the entire stack, that an application was sort of top down. You had a database and you had an application server and you had some you know, HTML templates and some janky CSS and some JavaScript that made everyone unhappy. And, uh, and now, you know, our, our application architectures fan out and they're far more distributed. Maybe you have several sources of truth for different data points that you're pulling in. Maybe you're feeding in from an API over here and a database over there. And what we're talking about here with stateless processes is really about your application instance processes. So this is the executable code that you wrote that you want to deploy and not necessarily you know, a database. And if we think about those as completely separate items, then, then that's where we can have stateless processes. So your process itself should not carry any state with it. That state has to go elsewhere. It could be a caching layer. Uh, it could be, excuse me, a configuration service. It could be a database and so on, but it has to be elsewhere. So LRP is a long-running process, so schedule your long-running processes by distributing them across a cluster of physical hardware. That cluster of physical hardware part, I think, is also important because as developers, we like to say it runs on my machine by running one instance of something and then claiming that we did everything right, only to find out that in staging or in production, when we have five instances or 50 instances, um, we had some single point of failure or some state that we were, we were handling in our application as part of its uh, running system, and, uh, and we didn't realize that. So it's important for us to be aware that not only will we run maybe a pre-forked server model style where you have a couple of different processes that run beside each other on a physical machine, um, but we'll also run those processes potentially on dozens of physical machines that are completely isolated aside from some network interaction. And it's important for us to be aware that there are, there are significant operational characteristic differences between distributed on many different physical pieces of hardware or VMs uh, or sort of co-located on, on one machine. Um, the scheduling of long-running processes on these distributed systems is a, is a relatively solved problem, but it's still a hard problem, and that's why we have things like Mesos with Marathon and Kubernetes and, and Cloud Foundry and Diaz and, and Docker Swarm and <laughs> so many things that call themselves you know, orchestration tools or scheduling tools. Um, I would highly recommend that if you're already working with containers and you're not using tools like that, start looking into them. Uh, it is a challenging problem. And uh, you, know, you can do it all on your own if you want to, but just it's an incredible amount of work. So consider the trade-offs there. Uh, here it is, yeah. Don't, don't do NFS. <laughs> I don't know why I put it there. But I'll say it again, just don't rebuild NFS. <laughs> that would have been a lot funnier a few slides back. Exporting services via port binding. So ser when we say services here, this, this actually means the, um, the application that you're building, right? So this is your, your fancy Rails web app or uh, you know, your, your Go, magic Go thing that gets a million requests per second. Um, the code might be incredibly challenging to read from the back. Uh, but the best practices here are just a couple of examples in different programming languages. You know? um, the idea is you have uh, port information that you can get off of the environment, so get it off of the environment. So in Ruby, you get it with env.fetch. In Perl, uh, env curly bracket port. Uh, if Java is your thing, you can get it off of the environment with Java. It's relatively simple. I'm trying to explain it's a couple of lines of code. And that's the difference between a pom.xml config.yaml config or hard-coded in your application. But don't 
make an assumption about what port your application is going to be running on when you spin it up in production. It's not port 80 anymore, right? It's not port 443. Who likes Rust? This is Rust. I'm just starting to get into it a little bit. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not super good. Uh, I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and there are two people in my local community, Jake Goulding and Carol Nichols, who are both absolutely amazing at Rust. Jake is like number one on Stack Overflow, and he didn't pay me to do this advertisement, um, but he's a real good guy, so uh, they're, they're both amazing. Scale out via the process model. Uh, we all know this already, right? So you're running a, a pre-forked web server or something like that. You're, you're basically doing this. So horizontally scale by adding instances. So in a pre-forked model, you had a, you had a sort of controller agent that managed a couple of different processes, made sure they were up and running. Um, in this idea, uh, that, that works great on one machine, but now we have maybe an entire cluster of dozens of machines that, that are our computing resources. So we want to horizontally scale our applications across them. So you don't want them to, to depend on one another. If, uh, if a controller agent goes down, you don't want it to take down you know, a 25% or whatever of your, of your computing resources. So let them stand up and run individually as single threaded processes. I shouldn't say that, as not pre-forked processes. Uh, doing green threads or something like that in Go is perfectly acceptable. Maximize robustness with fast startup and, and graceful shutdown. I don't have a best practice or an anti-pattern here because one of the beauties of the container model with the Linux kernel is that they're, they're incredibly quick to spin up. Uh, and they're incredibly quick to destroy. As developers, we can destroy, we can, we can make that harder by doing something like uh, uh, eager cache loading in memory uh, in our application instances, sucking a bunch of things out of debate databases to try and make our app run faster. But we already agreed that we wouldn't do things like that because it's, a, it's an anti-pattern from before. So I will assume that everyone here doesn't do things like that. Or if you are, that'll be one of the first things you refactor when you get back to work. Um, so I think that's about, about it on that. Keep development, staging, and production as similar as possible. So the beauty here is that Docker containers give you a lot for free to be able to do that. If you really are. A lot of these things build on each other, right? So if you really are building immutable infrastructure, if you are building an immutable artifact that you can ship around, if you're deploying that same version 1.0 to a development environment, staging environment, production environment, then your application runs in a similar environment in every situation. Um, the beauty of it is that the contract and the interface between your application and its surrounding environment, say backing services, can be handled by something as simple as environment variables. So, uh, so you don't need a full services broker with auto provisioning on your, on your development machine. Um, but as long as you honor the contract of how to connect to a backing service using the same very basic technology of environment variables, then you're good to go, right? Then you're operating your application in development like you would in production. So I would also recommend running containers in development. Uh, what does that mean? So if you're working in a service-oriented architecture, if you've got a couple of different services, or let's just say you're working on one Rails app, but it connects to Redis and RabbitMQ, and you got some MySQL in there, and you know maybe a, a Twitter API. Well, maybe not a Twitter API. Uh, run those, those uh, dependency services in containers on your local machine in order to simulate, again, like the, the network interactions that you get between your applications and the things that they rely on in, in a production distributed system. Uh, Docker Compose is great for that. Or Docker Machine is great for that. Who's using either of those? Docker Compose, Docker Machine? They're very cool. If I remember right, I think Docker Machine was written by an Aussie. Sven? Uh, and he works for Docker. I don't know if he's here, but, uh, but he's a cool, cool, go cool guy. Treat logs as event streams. So the anti-pattern here is don't just randomly log, you know, yolo shit all over the place and call that logging. You know, that's not, that's not a thing. So we don't do that. We don't do that anymore. Oh, it messed up my joke, bro. OK. So we, we use standard out. So again, since these things build on each other, if you are already building containers, where you're running a single process, and you're running it in the foreground, and you're using the process model in order to do horizontal scalability, 
then you've got one process that's running. It's in the foreground. It's not a daemon anymore. We don't, we don't do that with Docker containers. You run something right up front. And so just log everything to standard out. It's the simplest possible thing you could do, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Like, that's, like, that's, that's, that's the easiest thing. So just do that. All right, we're, we're getting to the end. So run admin and management tasks as one-off processes. So don't build custom containers for your tasks. Um, so whenever you're distributing workloads into a containerized environment, whenever you have a scheduler, now you can't just SSH onto a machine and run, you know, rake whatever I feel like today. Uh, so how do you handle that? How do you get that code out there and how do you get it so that you can, you can run it? You also don't want to build a special admin application with a bunch of do it buttons in it, right? Who's written do it.sh? in their lifetime. Yeah, me too. We will all have to pay for that someday. So you don't want to build applications to just deploy them into production and forget about them forever with a do it.sh button right, on the application. So reuse the application images that you've already built, which have your source code and functionality, and have the possibility of having uh, one-off tasks be runnable within them. Uh, reuse those, ap those application images by being able to invoke them one time with different entry points. So in the Docker ecosystem, you Docker run something like Ruby app.rb, if you like you know, Sinatra, or you know, Rails server, or what, what have you. But all the code that you need, if you're, do if you're, if you're building your, your code well, in order to run you know, a special migration task should be in your container already. So you can also invoke that container with a special command to run, right? So that way you don't have to deploy more shit. It's already there. Let's see, how are we doing here? Oh, all right, here's the payoff. You are all now cloud native, now that we've gotten to this point. How do you feel about that? I didn't think so. I, I, you know, I'm not so sure about the whole cloud native <laughs> uh, concept. But really, uh, I'll reiterate, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about taking 12-factor application design principles and architecture principles, applying them to our infrastructure and the way that we deploy and schedule and manage our workloads, especially when it comes to distributed systems or systems with a, an increasing proliferation of services or microservices if you're into that sort of thing. And we want to make them repeatable, reliable, and resilient. And that is what can help your op operators not get paged at 3 a.m. Right? So, so these guidelines, I hope, will help you with that. Um, your, your application developer should already be working on the refactoring of the 12-factor piece. And if we, as container builders, whether it's in the DevOps world where you build it, you run it, or in a more traditional model where you have release engineering or an operations team that are working on these immutable artifacts, we should apply the same principles and we should hold each other to the same standards. I think that'll make life better. Um, so, I think we might be, we might be all right. So, um, who, who has questions? Do we have any questions? I think there are microphones that get passed around. I just covered everything. And there's nothing else to know. And I didn't make any mistakes. And no one disagrees with me. Absolutely perfect. Ah, cheers, cheers, thank you. Hi. Um, you just talked about deploying containers that have got like all the code but different entry points. Is that something that is going to make security people nervous? You know, dead code hanging around just waiting to be exploited, for example? Great question. So will it make security people nervous to deploy code that might have a specific management functionality? Um, so this is where I have to put on my developer and, and sort of architecture lead engineer hat and say, uh, if that is the way that you build doit.sh, then, then you might have some architectural principles that are, that are unfortunate, we'll say. <laughs> uh, so when you build a management task, let's say, you know, for the sake of explanation, how many folks are into Ruby? Uh, a few, okay. Well, so like in the Rails ecosystem, you, you can build special one-off tasks, right? And they run on the command line. They use rake. Uh, 
Um, if you're old school like me, then you remember just doing that in make, because I, I don't see why that's very challenging, but, but everyone has to build their own, so they have rake. And uh, the way that I would recommend that we build these tasks, the way that I've instructed the teams that I've worked on to build these tasks, is that you leverage application code, that you do not write uh, sort of a bolted on wart of uh, migration without building those concepts into your application code. And the idea here is that if you wanted to move, say, a data structure from one format to another, or, or the way it's stored from one format to another, you're going to do that over the course of several uh, deployments. And you may have to have some migration phases in, in the middle of that. Um, you should build those migration phases into, the, say, the classes or the models for that data, the way that it's represented in your application. It should be code reviewed. It should have tests. And the beauty of that is that by the time you get to the end of the migration, hopefully that one of the pull requests that you approve is to remove it. So don't, you have to try not to leave that dead code in there. It's similar to the rigor that you need in order to, to use uh, feature flags effectively without, again, allowing dead code to fester out there or potentially harmful endpoints that everyone forgot about, right? So I think um, it certainly can be a challenge. I would, I would caution and, and argue for um, your engineering leadership, you know, the people in your org who, who are making decisions to have a, a very structured and well thought out plan for how you do these one-off tasks in production. Because one of the other challenges is that you're doing them anyway, right? So why not do it in a way that, uh, that, that is easy to manage and hopefully easy to also remove dead code? Yeah, I was just going to ask about debugging production issues with immutable containers. H how do you manage that? Because shit goes wrong in production, and you, you can't necessarily solve it in your development environment. Yeah, that's, that's great. So the question is about debugging issues with containers in production. That's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, it never ceases to amaze me. Uh, when we talk about developers saying it runs on my machine, so it's ops problem now, right? Um, one of the things that that they don't realize is the operational characteristics of your application have far more to do with the shape and size of the data, for example, or the way uh, network expectations are, uh, your expectations on concurrency, for instance, the, the, wor the workload, basically, that your application is under. And in development, you can never simulate those things for anything of any reasonable significance. Um, Incidentally, that, that's the part that operators forget whenever they yell at, uh, at developers and say, you write shitty software that never works. It never works in production. You don't know what you're doing. Well, then give me the three terabytes of data that I should be able to debug with whenever I'm in development. How do I do that? You don't. And then developers will ask, well, how can I debug in production? Then give me access. Let me SSH into that machine. Let me uh, check out some memory profiling. And, and of course, operators are like, hell no, I'm never going to let you do that. You already write shitty software. How should I trust you with my, <laughs> with my VM, right? Um, so what I found uh, to work well with the containerized model, I think it, it works even better than our traditional model, is that it allows you, uh, and we're going to talk about some, some higher level as aspects of, of production infrastructure as well in order to answer this question. But it allows you to um, potentially enter a container that might be misbehaving, a specific instance of your application once you identify it. Um, and muck around with it in order to debug it. Uh, the important bit to remember here is that if you do have a dis distributed system, and these days you can't have you know, fewer than three of anything, right? We have to respect cap theorem. We have to know that things will, things will go wrong, and we have to plan for that. Um, you should be able to enter into a container and maybe muck around with it in a production environment. But the beauty of it is you, should, uh, you, you have to have some controls around that. You should be able to take it out of the pool that's handling live requests. So that's a load balancer issue, right? Um, and you should also know that any time you touch it, it's now a special snowflake. And we don't like special snowflakes, so it has to be destroyed. <laughs> and then we have to treat them like cattle. We have special snowflake and we have cattle, but I don't think that, I don't, think we, I don't know, I just can't get behind being that ruthless to cattle. But, um, but if you do muck around with a container by entering into it, or maybe you, maybe you end up building your containers with an SSH daemon, which you can do, um, then, uh, then you have to be prepared to throw it away. Because if you taint it, if you change it, it's no longer the same thing that's running with everything else. So just make sure that you, you throw it away. And you have to have some rigor around that. You have to make sure you do it uh, well. 
So there's a little bit more that you need than just, say, a scheduler and a container in order to make that something that you can do. But, but I do think it's a little better. You can also save the state of a running container uh, and ship it around, right? So you can move it into a safe environment and maybe try to, to recreate those characteristics in staging. So I think that's uh, something that the container ecosystem, the container model, um, makes a little bit easier for us than a VM. Yeah, this will be the last question. So I appreciate the whole don't run NFS in your container <laughs> argument. Um, other than using the capabilities in Kubernetes to manage persistent storage, uh, what other options have you looked at? What other suggestions could you make for us to solve that problem? Right. So how do we solve storage problems in the cloud? So Kubernetes has, has some interesting things going on, as you mentioned, uh, with the, um, the network attack, attached volume type stuff. Um, you can also use Amazon's S3, or if you like OpenStack, you might use, uh, what do they call it, Swift? Um, so uh, when it comes to something that looks suspiciously like file storage, you, you need to use other alternatives these days. You need to think about blob storage as a, as a broad concept or key value storage. Um, these, are, these are the ways that, that people tend to um, fork, when they are, there's a concept called forklifting your app into the cloud that you have to kind of like get it up there somehow and there's a little bit of work there. Uh, if you are relying strictly on a file system, and you know, I've worked on systems that do that, and you know, it's amazing how much um, speed you can get out of uh, like a Berkeley DB based, you know, hashed file system structure on SSDs that are running on Isilons that you bought from EMC for a billion dollars, and you can get you can get some speed out of that. Uh, and then you and then you tell the engineers who put that beautiful thing together that hey, we're going to scrap all that, and you're just going to store things in a key value store with some persistent backups and. They lose their minds and set their hair on fire, and, and they, they rightly claim that your application is going to slow down, and it probably will. On the other hand, the benefits that you get from having made that migration in terms of repeatability and resilience and reliability, I think far outweigh some specific low-level performance metrics and performance gains that you might get um, from relying, relying on the file system. That, this won't be a universal truth. It's not true for every application, um, but I would argue that for most applications, you just have to think about doing things a little bit differently, and that means network-attached storage that, that looks a little different, has an API, uh, other than F open. All right, we're at lunch, so thank you very much, Casey. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we'll return after lunch at 1.20.